I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to Scott Middle School's 25th Annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration. Today our rally and march looks a bit different than it has for 25 years, but our content will still seek to empower, educate, and engage. I have a dream, Martin spoke, unbroken and sturdy with no sign of deter. A man of his word and one of change, one who marched on no matter the hindrance. A spark of love in a sea of hate, unsatisfied with the world around it. It grew from spark to flame and flame to fire, a light shining on the racial injustices of the world. One, get yourself into the good trouble the necessary trouble, the kind John Lewis spoke about in his last words when he stated, ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. But we must keep moving. We must keep going. And if you can't fly, then we need you to run. If you can't run, we need you to walk. And if you can't walk, then by all means, we need you to crawl. But by all means, you need to keep moving. We are going to march. Believe it. The teachers are going to march. The teachers are going to march. 104 of us teachers and somebody, somebody stood on the steps of Brown Chapel with our toothbrushes in the air, gleaming like swords in the summer sun. Ready to go to jail for freedom. We started marching. When Mr. Temi hires people from other countries, it doesn't matter to him if they speak English or not. Just like with his first employee, Mr. Temi is able to teach and train people who do not yet speak English to, the, to do the jobs in his manufacturing company. He has met many wonderful people over the years who were incredibly talented workers. Currently, his company employs 40 employees from 19 different countries. And when you found the work that you love so much, I mean, you just can't wait to go to work. And it becomes better than fun. So thank you very much. I mean, I am so honored. And uh, I look forward to seeing this world becomes yours. And uh, us older folks, well, uh, we're, we're, we're watching, and we know it's going to be a better world just because of you. Thank you very much. This meeting of the Lincoln Public Schools Board of Education for January 25th, 2022 is called to order. Laura, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer. Ms. Byer is excused. Mr. Boswell. Present. Mrs. Danik. Here. Mrs. Duncan. Here. Mr. Mayhew. Present. Ms. Mumgard. Here. Dr. Rauner. Here. The Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted and available at the main entrance of the room. We have minutes from our board meeting and special meeting on January 11th for approval. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved as published. For special reports, presentations, and celebrations of success, 6.1 staff celebration. Lanny, I will let you go first. Thank you. Carlo Halpine, would you please join me at the podium? I move the board adopt the following resolution. Whereas Carla Halpine from Lux Middle School was named the 2020 Nebraska French Teacher of the Year by the Nebraska International Languages Association, and whereas Carla Halpine serves as a mentor and professional resource for her colleagues who benefit greatly from her experience and dedication, and whereas Carla Halpine demonstrates an ability to make strong connections with both students and their families, <laughs> And whereas Carla Halpine is a passionate advocate for world language education and the teaching of French, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Lincoln Board of Education 
is hereby congratulate Carla Halpine for being named the 2020 Nebraska French Teacher of the Year by the Nebraska International Languages Association, signed by our President Connie Duncan and Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Steve Joel. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it was indeed a surprise, truly. I've taught, LP, I've taught for LPS for 26 years, um, 26 French uh, class, or 26 years of French, and I did teach a year of German. Um, so I really am super passionate about languages. And I just want to thank my colleagues and my administrators. I've worked in many buildings. I've taught 6th through 12th grade. And I'm just really, I don't know, I'm very honored to work for a district who does look at languages, world languages, as something very important. And I love bringing that to our kids so that they can become members of you know, a global community. So thank you so much. I appreciate the honor. Thank you. And quickly, did you bring anyone with you that you'd like to introduce? You could just. Well, then we're all here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. We will move on to 6.2. Oops, we will not. Is there a second? Ms. Danik. I would second that motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 6.1. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. And now we'll move on to 6.2, staff celebration. Ms. Danik, you're up. Yes, and could I please have Ms. Stephanie Miller meet me at the podium? <clears throat> This is from a proud Mickle grad to a Mickle teacher. Mm -hmm. Whereas Stephanie Miller from Mickle Middle School was named the 2021 Nebraska French Teacher of the Year by the Nebraska International Language Association. And whereas Stephanie Miller displays a passion for teaching French. And whereas Stephanie Miller brings joy and energy to the classroom that is passed on to her students. And whereas Stephanie Miller is valued respected and admired among her colleagues, both at her school and across this school district. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this Lincoln Board of Education does hereby congratulate Stephanie Miller for being named the 2021 Nebraska French Teacher of the Year by the Nebraska International Languages Association. And this is in the form of a motion, and I so move. Signed by Connie Duncan and Dr. Steve Joel. Um, thank you so much for this honor. Um, I really enjoy teaching French, uh, especially with LPS. It's been such a great um, community to work with. I have really, really great colleagues, um, really great administrators, um, and I'm just really appreciative to have, have this honor. So thank you. And do you have anyone you'd like to introduce? No, it's bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that loud and clear. Thank you. Is there a second? Mr. Boswell? Second. Any discussion? Laura, please call the roll to approve item 6.2. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? We. Oui. Dr. Rauner? <laughs> yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Next staff celebration, 6.3, Dr. Rauner. Yes, could I have Ms. Uh, Julia Evans uh, come to the podium? So I'd like to uh, frame this in a motion. Uh, whereas Julia Evans brings a tremendous amount of creativity to her teaching, which leads to an enriched learning environment for her students, and whereas Yulia Evans is nationally recognized for her teaching, and whereas Yulia Evans was demonstrated, has demonstrated a dedication to students that is a model for her colleagues, now therefore be it resolved that the Lincoln Board of Education is hereby congratulate Yulia Evans for being named 2020 German, Nebraska German Teacher of the Year by the Nebraska International Languages Association, signed by Board President Connie Duncan and Superintendent of Schools Stephen Joel, 
Uh, and if you'd like to make any comments or if you want to introduce anybody. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, it's a great honor to be here today and I would like to express my gratitude first to my family who are here today, to my partner, Corey, to the wife of my ex-husband, Kayla, and to our daughter, Sasha. And thank you very much for always supporting me with all my ideas. I'm also very, very thankful for my former and current students and their families for allowing me to serve them and to allow me to share my knowledge with them, to learn about the world and to, to help me to learn about me, about the world as well. I'm grateful for my practicum students. I work a lot with practicum students and with student teachers, and I'm very, very glad that the majority of them decided to stay in the educational profession. And I also very much appreciate my colleagues, and department chair Lisa is here today, and the administration team from school at the building at East High, and principal is here today, Ms. Casada. And, um, on the district level, Ms. Demkard and uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Dr. Demkard and Dr. Tyler are here today also. Thank you so much for all your support, for guidance, for, for everything, for the opportunities to serve the East community as well as to serve the world education teachers. And thanks again for honoring here me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second, Mr. Boswell? Second. Any discussion? Go ahead. So tonight we honored three foreign language teachers, world language teachers. It's an experience a lot of kids don't know. They're, they really get to experience uh, the idea that a language can become a gateway to them to travel the world as the quote-unquote grandmother of several foreign exchange students, one from Germany, one from Thailand, and one from Spain, I learned more from them in one year than I probably learned in all my world language studies in high school. But I want to thank you for what you do and the experiences you give our students. And if you ever can want to teach a strudel-making class, I would love to learn. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Danik. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 6.3. Mrs. Danik. Yes. Mr. Mayhew. Yes. Ms. Mumgard. Yes. Dr. Rauner. Yes. Mr. Boswell. Yes. Mrs. Duncan. Yes. Item 6.4, the HYA superintendent final candidates. Mike and Heather, I will let you proceed. Well, thank you. It's great to be back here. My only one regret is that the Wisconsin-Nebraska basketball game was postponed to Thursday. <laughs> but, oh well. Um, it, it's been a great search. I know many of you put in long hours reviewing everything, so we want to say thank you for that. Uh, our, our team has worked diligently um, to bring you the best of the best that have applied for the position. And what we want to do tonight is just talk a little bit about the search in general, and then we're going to break down the um, people that, individuals that we would like to recommend to move forward to the uh, next round of, of interviews. So, it's so a little background. Um, we did end up with uh, 27 uh, applicants total. However, seven of those were either uh, incomplete or they ended up withdrawing for whatever reason. So we really had 20 um, that completed all the necessary paperwork and that we did vet and we looked at very closely. So what we are seeing across the nation is a shortage of superintendents. Um, if you, fewer and fewer people are applying for positions, so we were pleased with 20. Um, if you go to the HYA website, you will see currently there's 573 superintendent positions posted, 573 across the U.S. 
Uh, we did reach out to many uh, other individuals and we followed leads and recommendations. So we do feel we have a good slate to propose to you tonight. Um, we did consider all 20. We vetted them. We did a, the, our entire team, the, the three of us, um, we did a Zoom pre-screener with most of them. Uh, we, did, we did not do the pre-screener if they were not qualified. So in other words, there were a couple in that pool of 20 that would not have been eligible to receive an administrative license. Um, they did not have the proper uh, education or degree, um, and they were just uh, not qualified uh, for this position. Um, so what we tried to do is, is look at the uh, pool of 20 and really match the best fit to the district profile report. And um, we're going to talk about uh, four individuals uh, this evening. So I think with that said, we're going to get right into the, uh, our proposal of the four individuals. Okay, hey, these are uh, not in any particular order. They're alphabetical by last name. So our first candidate is Dr. Paul uh, Gossman. Dr. Gossman is currently the superintendent of Sioux City Community School District in Sioux City, Iowa. His district has an enrollment of 15,000 students. He's been serving there as a superintendent since 2008. Prior to that, from 2005 to 2008, he was a superintendent of West Central School District in Hartford, South Dakota. From 2004 to 2005, he was the coordinator of middle school education in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. From 2000 to 2004, he served as the coordinator of fine arts in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. From 1995 to 2000, he was the director of bands in Millard. West High School in Millard Public Schools in Omaha. And then he served a year here as the Associate Director of Bands at Lincoln Northeast, right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And then he spent three years as a Director of Bands in Wisner Pilger Public Schools here in Nebraska. So he definitely has um, that Midwest um, experience uh, across his resume. And we want to just point out a few um, either awards or community highlights of each of these individuals. And this is by no means the entire list. We just want to give you kind of a flavor of what things they do uh, throughout their communities. And so in 2018, uh, he was the uh, National Superintendent of the Year finalist for NASS. He, in 2014, he was the Superintendent of the Year for the State of Iowa. He was on the Girls Inc. board. He, was a he is a Rotarian. He's involved in the Children's Museum. He was a board member. He also was a Chamber board member, a United Way board member, and he is currently the Urban Superintendents Association of America uh, president. Very strong recommendations, and um, we would say he's definitely qualified and fits the profile report. The next candidate is Dr. Peter Lucata. He currently serves as the Regional Superintendent for the School District of Palm Beach County in Florida. The enrollment that he oversees is 65,000 students. Prior to that, from 2000, he's been in that position um, in Palm Beach since 2011. Prior to that, from 2010 to 2011, he served in the same district in Palm Beach County as the Assistant Superintendent. In 2009 to 2010, he was an area director um, overseeing quality assurance for the school district of Palm Beach County, Florida. And he also worked as a um, secondary curriculum and school improvement uh, for the same school district. In 2000, he, he worked in the same district from 2005 to 2009, um, also in curriculum. In 2002 to 2005, he was a principal of Olympic Heights Community High School in, in Boca Raton, Florida. From 1998 to 2002, he was a principal of Boca Raton Community Middle School in Boca Raton, Florida. In 1994 to 1998, he was the assistant principal of Eagles Landing Middle School in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, and his prior experience before that was as a teacher. 
Uh, also, as far as community involvement, well, first of all, for an award, I guess, the district received the governor's recognition as a top school statewide for achievement. Uh, he has served on the Business Development Board, the Palm Beach Education Foundation, the Career Youth, the Career Source Youth Outreach Board. So again, very uh, vetted and uh, visible in and throughout his community. Okay, our next candidate is Dr. Jamie Jo Thompson. She is currently the superintendent of Norfolk Public Schools in Norfolk, Nebraska. The enrollment is 4,500 students. She's been the superintendent there since 2013. Prior to that, in 2008 to 2013, she was the director of student programs in Beatrice Public Schools in Beatrice, Nebraska. From 2003 to 2008, she was a special education and staff development coordinator in Beatrice Public Schools. In 1995 to 2005, she served as a special education teacher in the same district. And as far as uh, community involvement and awards, uh, she did re was a recipient of the Milken Foundation's National Educator Award, uh, the Nebraska Career and Technical Education Administrator of the Year, North Fork uh, Person of the Year, Pre she was president of the Greater Nebraska Schools Association, President of the Greater Nebraska Superintendents, National Advisor for Special Olympics Project Unify, and she was also a chamber board member. And the next candidate, Mr. Antoine Wilson. He's presently an assistant professor at Westland University here in Nebraska, here in Lincoln. Um, He's been in that position since 2018. He's also the CEO of Schoolwise Educational Consulting. From 2017 to 2018, he was the Chancellor of the District of Columbia Public Schools in the District of Columbia. From 2014 to 2017, he was the Superintendent of Oakland School District in Oakland, California. From 2009 to 2014, he was the Assistant Superintendent of Post-Secondary Readiness in Denver Public Schools in Denver, Colorado. From 2008 to 2009, he was the Instructional Superintendent for High Schools in Denver Public Schools in Denver, Colorado. From 2005 to 2008, he served as the High School Principal for Montebello or for Montbello High School in Denver, Colorado. From 2003 to 2005, he was the principal for Pleasant Valley Middle School in Wichita, Kansas. 2001 to 2003, assistant principal for Wichita High School South in Wichita, Kansas. From 2000 to 2001, Lincoln High School instructional coordinator here in Lincoln Public Schools. Uh, he also served an administrative intern at Wichita High School East in Wichita, Kansas. And prior to that, he served as a middle school and high school teacher with experiences in Wichita as well as Raleigh, North Carolina. And as far as his community involvement, um, he is the LPS Community Multi Multiculture Advisory Task Force, Chiefs for Change Organization, the National Commission on Academic and Social Emotional Learning, Oakland NAACP Branch of Chapel of the Chime Service to Community Award, and the Edu Center Denver, Colorado Salute to Excellence School Executive of the Year. And again, I want to make sure I emphasize for all of these candidates, uh, first of all, their alphabetical order. There's no preference given to any of the four candidates. And if you look at their complete resume, there is more uh, involvement throughout the community and uh, awards and accolades that, that they have received throughout their, their career as well. So the, the four <coughs> individuals uh, that we presented to you would be our recommendation for the slate. And at this time, we would entertain any questions that you might have. We're going to move right into the next part. Um, we have now heard from our search firm consultants. At this point, does anyone wish to make a motion for approval of the slate of candidates? Mr. Mayhew. 
I move that we uh, approve this uh, as our slate of finalist candidates. Is there a second? Ms. Danik. I would second that motion. Ms. Duncan. Yes. I'm assuming that the motion is the motion that is in the board agenda, the, the exact wording to suspend your rules. The board approved the following individuals in alphabetical order as the finalists to be interviewed for the position of superintendent of Lincoln Public Schools. That interviews for the final pool will be held between the dates of uh, February 1 and I think it's now February 4. Uh, and that the final dates, times, details, and arrangements for the interviews are to be prepared and finalized by the consultant in cooperation with the board president. I'm assuming that is the motion. That was my understanding of the motion, yes. Very good, that is the understanding. Is there any discussion? Is there, does a seconder understand that? Yes, All yes right. she did too. Is there any discussion? I'd go ahead, like to go ahead and take the privilege then. Thank you, Mike, Heather, and Brian. He's somewhere out there for your dedication and hard work on our superintendent search. When we began our search process with HYA, it was determined that the Board of Education would be a committee of all seven board members that would be involved in the entire process. HYA has graciously allowed us to work side by side with them. Thank you for your patience, discussion, and willing to work with each of us. The past two weeks, board members were given access to all applications for the position of LPS superintendent. Board members reviewed all applications, keeping in mind what the community and LPS staff had identified as the best profile for a new superintendent. Board members were allowed to ask questions of HYA and discuss all candidates, not just the slate of candidates presented this evening. I feel confident that we did our due diligence. Following approval of the slate of candidates, we will be inviting candidates to visit Lincoln on February 1 and February 4 for a planned day of community interviews, parent interviews, and LPS staff, administrators, and principal interviews. The community is also invited to hear from each candidate during two special Board of Education meetings on February 1 and February 4, starting at 7.30 p.m. each night. The meetings will play, take place in the boardroom and will be live streamed. Community members will be invited to provide feedback through an online survey after listening to the full presentations. To allow all candidates an equal amount of time, there will not be a public comment period during the special meetings. There are multiple ways the community can view the live stream of the special meeting on our board webpage, the LPS YouTube channel, the LNK TV education channel as well. Based on our current timeline, the hope would be that we will make a selection on the February 22nd Board of Education meeting. More information about the finalists along with the interview schedule can also be found on the LPS website. Is there any further discussion board? Seeing none, Laura, please call the motion to approve item 6.4, the final candidate poll pool recommendations. Mr. Mayhew. Yes. Ms. Mumgard. Yes. Dr. Rauner. Yes. Mr. Boswell. Yes. Mrs. Danik. Yes. Mrs. Duncan. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, 6.5, the 2021 LPS pandemic plan and procedures. Thank you, Mrs. Duncan. Um, you know, as everybody's well aware, we took our first Friday <clears throat> last week. We're, uh, we're also going to take the next two Fridays just uh, as a way to give our staff a break and, and hopefully get more of our students back into school and more of our staff back into school. We're hoping that uh, the numbers are beginning to come down in the community. and. And if not now, hopefully sometime in the future. So I'm going to turn over to Dr. Rauner to get, uh, to get uh, an update from the work that he does. Well, from, the, from the Lincoln level, uh, we may be getting a little bit of a dip in cases. We're not sure yet. It'll take a little time. Usually I kind of wait for about a week to, to, to say something like that. Hospitalizations have been hovering from about 120 to 140 hospitalizations for the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's good that it's at least not going up. Uh, because down the road in Omaha, they just hit the highest the number of hospitalizations of the pandemic, a little over 450. Uh, it's getting to the point, too, where they're actually having to transfer patients back our way. 
uh, because of that. Th there's some sign of potentially things happening and, and then hopefully we'll follow the Northeast. So New York, New Jersey, they are uh, seeing what is likely a, a sustained dip. Um, the Southeast was kind of next. That dip might be real, but sometimes there are delays in reporting and hospitalizations. Sometimes they don't have a complete record for a week. So you always have to be careful about a slight dip like that. Our region is uh, still high and that yellow line, those are pediatric hospitalizations. Uh, that's a challenge. Uh, Children's Hospital is full in Omaha and they're actually having about three times as many COVID hospitalizations as they've, as they've had so far to the point that they're actually sending some of those kids to Lincoln. So if you go to Brian Health's dashboard, you'll see a couple kids at Brian Health Health with, uh, with COVID because they're uh, taking some of the lower complexity overflow patients uh, from Children's Hospital. Uh, the challenge of this, the reason we're in this situation is that our booster vaccine rates are so much lower. Uh, you'll see the big bucket of countries, most of the European Union, for example, Turkey and Canada as well. United States is, States is in that lower tier. We only have about 25% of our population that had a booster. So people are hoping that we'll follow the United Kingdom's rates, but United Kingdom has far more people vaccinated and boosted than we do. And so we're not, we hope we'll follow the United Kingdom's uh, trajectory and start having a downward trend, but we don't know that yet. We'll see in the next uh, coming weeks. Uh, Nebraska in particular, although the U.S. is 25% with boosters, Lincoln specifically is 34%, so it's a little better. But we still have a significant portion of the population that does not ha has not had their booster vaccine yet. Uh, that's a challenge because uh, if you look at the children with, with MISC, uh, the peak for developing multi-inflammatory syndrome in kids, which often happens two to six weeks after their infection, is five to 11-year-olds. And we don't have, a, uh, I think we're roughly about 30-some percent of our kids with, with the first vaccine as well. But that's one reason we've been having uh, the vaccine clinics at several of our, our schools, which we hear are being very well attended lately. Uh, I think sometimes there's a little confusion about what we're trying to prevent is that the vaccines aren't necessarily designed to prevent all infections uh, and it's a difference be and I use, use uh, a lot of us will use a combination contrast between measles and COVID or and Omicron specifically measles has a long incubation uh, phase of about 10 to 14 days from exposure to developing the disease that gives plenty of time for your antibodies which is your first line of defense to start working and then your memory B cells which will then re reawaken your system uh, uh, immune system make more antibodies uh, it's easy when you have measles. The challenge with Omicron is the incubation phase is, is only two to three days uh, frequently, and sometimes that's not enough time. So yes, you might get a, a fever or a runny nose or a cough, uh, but it's preventing the complications, the hospitalizations, the other complications, death is the main effect. Uh, and that's been pretty clear. Um, again, uh, Matt Donahue, our state epidemiologist, this is, this is all Nebraska data, all Nebraska hospitalizations for COVID. Uh, the orange line is the people with no vaccine. Uh, many of them have had prior infections before, so yes, they have some immunity, but it's not enough to keep a lot of these people out of the hospital. The blue line, those are people with two shots, and that green line, very low, is the is people with a booster. So a 46-fold reduction, and this is coming straight out of Nebraska uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, so again, the, the biggest thing, it's a pandemic, mostly then vaccinated and immunocompromised as far as our hospitalizations rates right now. Uh, if you're unvaccinated, please go get vaccinated. And if you're immunocompromised, the solution is to vaccinate as many people around them and step up to a, uh, a better quality mask. And that's the update. Thank you, Dr. Rauner. And I would just uh, follow up with um, just great appreciation for the, the, the timely information you're able to provide us. Our hope is to continue to analyze the data and then, you know, analyze our attendance and uh, make the best decisions that we can going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Our next item is public com comment. We will hear speakers for one hour and then move into our business meeting. The last public comment, we will hear the remainder of the speakers. Blue cards are available at the entrance for those wishing to speak. Each speaker is allowed five minutes and pr may provide printed materials to the board. Please begin your remarks by introducing yourselves and we will inform you when one minute remains. Section 84-1412 of the Nebraska Open Meetings Law now requires that any member of the public desiring to provide public comment or to otherwise address the board shall identify themselves, including an address and the name of any organization represented by such a person. The first speaker is Courtney Nelson. Good evening. My name is Courtney Nelson. Uh, my address is on file. Um, I'm here to talk about my little friend, Reese. Um, 
His mom, Jen, is one of my best friends, and she gave me permission to share a story because she wasn't able to be here. Reese is a healthy special needs boy that attends Irving Middle School. He has a rare syndrome that impacts him physically and mentally, but more in a social and cognitive way. Only one in a million people are diagnosed with the rare, rare syndrome that Reese has. Because of how rare it is, there is very little research for managing his diagnosis. He'd been bullied multiple times this year by kids who called him names and taunted him into saying inappropriate words that got him punished within school suspension. But the bullies, they were reminded not to target Reese. That situation has since dissolved, but very little advocacy was done on Reese's part by either the principal or special ed director at Irving. When this was reported by Jen, Reese's mom, to the director of special education here in your main office, it was dismissed because the director assured Jen that the principal had resolved it. And by resolved, Jen observed that it was only her son who was punished. Jen let it go because she knows that Reese needs to be in school and she's seen how much he thrives with in-person learning. Things have stayed fairly calm until last week when he was suspended again. This time it was for a mask violation and it was not in school suspension. Reese has gone through a lot in life to get to where he's at. He's smart, funny, and kind and works hard to be successful and learn. Because of the cognitive and sensory components of his diagnosis, he is quickly distracted and overstimulated by the mask and how it affects his breathing. On top of that, his train of thought and learning is constantly interrupted by mask reminders from his teachers. Apparently, Reese, a cognitive struggling student, maxed out on reminders and he was suddenly suspended from school last Thursday. Nowhere does your face covering requirement as outlined in Safe Return to School say how to wear a mask. According to your own website, since Reese had a face mask on his face, he was within your guidelines. And yet he was still suspended. Jen had to advocate hard for Reese. Her main goal is that one day he will graduate, get a job, and have a normal life, like we all want for our kids. She knows consistency and routine are vital for Reese's chance at success. I would think that an institution that prides themselves in being committed to providing the highest quality education for Lincoln students would uphold their own mission statement and accommodate vulnerable students like Reese. Your mask mandate does not help Reese achieve any of these goals. Instead, it creates a huge hurdle that he can't get over. And then you arbitrarily pe penalize him even though he was following your written standard. By taking Reese out of school and interrupting his routine and rhythm, it undoes more success than can be made up for later. And all because you are enforcing a medical device that Reese has a written medical exemption from his own doctor for. You are not Reese's primary care providers or his cardiologist or his therapist. You are an educational institution, not a medical practice. You have no documentation to prove that unmasked kids are spreading the virus. You also have no right to prescribe a medical device in exchange for a proper education. You have one job, and that is to make sure Reese is successful academically. There is so much wrong here. Bullying special needs classmates is tolerated and ignored in this case, but a mask violation calls for suspension. This is an administration problem, not a student problem, and the ones that should be suspended are not the kids. The American Academy of Pediatrics indicates almost zero risk of fatal COVID for kids, and the science backing how masking protects them is still ever-changing. Why aren't all the consequences of masking being considered at LPS? You cherry-pick the data you want and then disregard the very real facts while enforcing unproven methods. What we do know is that students need their schools to support their overall academic goals. They need your advocacy to be prepared for the real world. You should be shamed for using your platform as a means to cripple and disparage kids like Reese over a medical device you are not authorized to prescribe. After suspending another kid, before suspending another kid like Reese, please look at the skyrocketing mental health crisis of youth just in Lincoln. Take a look at the plummeting test scores, dropouts, low graduation percentage, One and minute, dropping please. enrollment rates within LPS. Specific masking procedures is not the litmus test for success in school, nor will it improve your records. Reese keeping his mask perfectly in place is not helping him become a successful adult. He could wear it perfectly and still not get better grades. If you treated every student like you treated Reese last Thursday, would you just suspend them all? Your classrooms would be empty, but your face mask policy would no longer be violated. Is that the score we're looking for? COVID is not what's putting kids at risk. The COVID protocols you have prioritized over student success is severely harming kids like Reese and many others. It really needs to stop. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Martin Lippert. Martin Nippard, 1777 Dunraven Court. 
Um, I'd like to start out with a Christmas internet meme, if you don't mind. Um, so there's a little girl sits on Santa's lap and says, uh, all I want for Christmas is a unicorn. And Santa replies, come on, be realistic. And the uh, little girl says, okay, I want a government that doesn't lie to me about COVID. And Santa comes back with, all right, what color unicorn? I thought I was cute. So the rest of my presentation will be about the, if the mitigation policies you support made things worse for the people during this crisis. And my thesis is, yes, they did. Uh, I'm not telling you anything new when I point out that lost educational opportunity translates to lost economic opportunity, which in turn translates to lost life years. So your hyper-focus on defeating COVID now actually causes lost life years later on in life. And I believe that anyone listening to you, to your group here, would conclude that you view yourself as champions of the downtrodden, of minorities and of, poor, of the poor in general. I think that's a worthy cause, for sure. And my statement is a mere observation, not criticism. The problem arises when you look at the pandemic policies you support. Their harm to the population was not equitable. The most harm was and is caused to exactly this group of people you care so much about. Lost life years of poor kids will most certainly be greater compared to kids in affluent households. So if you have the slightest amount of concern about that, I'd really like you to speak up and stand up to your colleagues who may think otherwise. Uh, making the kids wear face masks in school is most definitely causing learning difficulties. And you can't tell me that your own experience of speaking with someone while wearing masks has not caused you to ask them to repeat something multiple times, right? Happens to me all the time. You can't possibly think that the kinds of masks and how they are worn by students makes any difference for the spread of the virus. It doesn't. In fact, when uh, Dr. Joel uh, recorded the announcements a few weeks ago that masks are once again required, he had a Freudian slip. Before saying that the mask policy would be reinstated, he said it would be reenacted. Remember that? I think he knows it's just an act. Mass theater. Uh, please take the masks off the kids and do it now rather than later. Not that it matters, but cases will go down very soon in very fast order. Now, my son is a senior in high school, and he said something very interesting to me, really shocking, actually. Uh, he said that his class is the only class that has experienced a full year of regular learning, regular learning, without any impediment. Yeah, that was his freshman year. In the spring of his sophomore year, you closed schools altogether and then made some half-baked attempt at remote learning. Most of his junior year, you did that ridiculous 3-2 schedule. Not good. In the senior year, you continue with unscientific mask wearing, and now we have Fridays for fun. <clears throat> that is our perspective, how you did. Interestingly, it's quite different from Dr. Joe's view, which he gave during the November 23rd meeting, quoting him verbatim. Consistent with Dr. Rauner's pandemic report, we haven't had to close schools. We managed this pandemic very well. Couldn't believe when I heard those words. Uh, LPS did close schools. Huh? How could you possibly say you didn't? We also closed businesses, but many people have forgotten that too, right? The people whose policies you support One minute, please. Still, uh, still think that closures and lockdowns were the right way to go. Among others, I'm talking about Dr. Anthony Fauci here as I like to call him by his mafia name, Tony Two-Face. So John Hopkins' meta-analysis of 24 independent studies looked at the effects of lockdowns on COVID deaths. The conclusion was that the effect was minuscule, but the unintended consequences were catastrophic. Was Fauci so wrong on that, how can he believe anything he says or forget that you close schools? I'm currently reading uh, Dr. Scott Atlas' book, A Plague Upon Our House. I mean, we just a very small portion. Fauci spoke to support Dr. Birx's concerns, saying people need to be warned even more strongly about the dangers of the virus spreading, about wearing masks and distancing. He claimed Americans didn't think the virus was serious, and that was the reason we had spread of it. I challenged him to clarify his point because he couldn't believe my ears. 
So you think people aren't frightened enough? He said, yes, they need to be more afraid. That's your guy. That's who you believe in. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen Fowler. Hi, I'm Kristen Fowler. <clears throat> um, and my address is on file. I'm here today to give my perspective as a parent on a policy that I believe is harming our children. It is putting their health and well-being below those with whom we, have, we are entrusting their mental, physical, and social development to, our teachers and administrators. I've always seen teachers as people who will take care of our children and put them first. I've always respected teachers. My sister is an elementary teacher, and she, like many of our teachers, does all she can to put the children first. From the CDC website, coronavirus droplets are smaller than 10 microns. It's an aerosol virus. Cloth masks block only droplets that are larger than 20 microns. And our children wear cloth masks. Thus, using a cloth mask is like putting a chain fence around your yard to keep the mosquitoes out. It's not helpful. Additionally, a washed cloth mask and reused have been found to increase the risk of infections. From an article by Naraj Sood, PhD, printed in the Orange County Register, July 16, 2021, masking is a psychological stressor for our children and disrupts learning. Covering the lower half of the face, both teacher and pupil, reduces the ability to communicate. In particular, children lose the experience of mimicking expressions and essential nonverbal communication. Positive emotions such as laughing and smiling become less recognizable, and negative emotions get amplified. Bonding between teachers and students take a hit. Overall, it is likely that masking exacerbates the chances that a child will experience anxiety and depression, which are already a pandemic at, pan uh, at pandemic levels themselves." End quote. Why can't we stop putting ourselves first? The science and research show that this virus is less destructive to children than the flu. During the 12-month period of October 2nd, 2020 through October 3rd, 2021, in children's, children ages 5 to 11, there were 66 COVID-19 associated deaths in the United States. In that same t period, there were 84 influenza and pneumonia deaths. There were also 66 intentional self-harm deaths or suicides. These numbers are from the CDC website. That does not touch on how many of those children had underlying conditions, and it also does not state whether those deaths were with COVID-19 or from COVID-19. And there is a difference. In many cases, a person who got into a car, ac car accident and died in that time frame, who tested positive for COVID-19, would have had it listed on their death certificate because that provided more funding for the hospitals, and I believe still does. It's time to start sacrificing for the good of the children. We need to stop requiring them to make the most sacrifice. From an article by Paul E. Alexander found on the American Institute for Economic Research website, March 10, 2021. During April 2020 to October 2020 in the US, emergency room visits linked to mental health problems for children aged five to 11 increased by nearly 25% and increased by 31% for those aged 12 to 17 years old as compared to the same period in 2019. While some of this may be related to the pandemic, we suspect that it is largely a function of our response to the pandemic, end quote. It is time that our children get to live a normal life. It is time for each individual to assess their own situation and take their own risks. It is time for parents to make decisions for their children. Let those that want to mask continue to mask. But for us who have a perspective that masks are a higher risk to a child's developmental and mental state, let us choose what is best for our children too. For those that believe in masks, if they help, they help whether one the minute, person please. next to you has one on or not. Thank you. Just a reminder, we do need everyone quiet in the audience when others are speaking, please. Julie Sheldon. Good 
Good evening. My name is Julie Sheldon, as you're well aware. You have my address on file as this is the 12th um, meeting I've been to. And I just wanted to congratulate you guys on the last meeting and your beautiful ambush of me. Um, anyone who believes that that uh, little presentation after I talked was uh, organic or in response to anything I said, <laughs> that's funny. Obviously, you guys had um, that prepared for me. And I'm a little surprised you probably should have had that on the agenda. As I mean, obviously, Mr. Larson had that all prepared and ready to speak. That was not a uh, spur of the th moment kind of a deal. Um, I just wanted to say that um, thank you for that, because honestly, I was getting a little complacent with my, my sp uh, how much time I spent researching and, and looking into the things that, that's in LPS. Um, but you definitely woke me up. Um, so I'm going to be doubling my efforts um, into looking in all the books that are in LPS. And uh, I really hope to get a lot of your uh, opinions on these books on record. As we all know, that there will be school board elections coming up in 2023. Um, I just wanted to say that you also inspired me to go and uh, pursue other avenues to let people know what's going on with LPS and the books that, y that are in the library and that you guys have defended. Um, I did go on Drive Time Lincoln with Jack Riggins, and uh, I have to say thank you for that. Um, he definitely gave me the uh, kick in the pants that I needed to uh, make sure that more parents in, in Lincoln were aware of what's going on, as obviously you've heard me talk about the book, Not My Idea, a book about whiteness. Very racist book. You've heard me talk about it since September or October. And although I haven't done the appeal, you guys have read, I read the book to you. You've seen uh, pages of the book. You've seen my uh, analysis of the book. You've also seen uh, where it's against, it actually goes against the policies that you guys have about multicultural books, about how they shouldn't, or they shouldn't um, make, the goal of multicultural education is to make sure that every child sees themselves in a positive light in the, in the materials that are um, available in LPS. I don't believe anyone thinks that a white child or any child would read that book and feel good about themselves. I did have Jacqueline Morrison um, from the state school board read that book, and she didn't like it either. And she told me, she said, I don't understand how any, um, black Americans would like this book either as it portrays them as victims of the police with their hands up as if, as if to say that that's their role in, in the country. Um, that book obviously has zero, zero um, details about why the individual in the beginning of the book was shot by the police and why he was interacting with the police. Um, I think we have seen the push against the police department and the push to defund our police. When in elementary school, as kids are growing up, we tell them that the police are who they need to go to when they're in trouble. That's who they need to go to when they're lost. That's who they need to seek if they're being abused or someone is, is hurting them. Yet here we are endorsing a book that says police are bad. You should be afraid of the police, especially if you're a, a, a black individual. So I just want to say, you guys have seen all of this, and yet you have chosen, obviously, not to remove the book. You certainly have that within your power. You don't need me to do an appeal. Um, so I, ju I do just want to thank you for, for basically inspiring me to take this to a, to a broader audience. Um, One minute, please. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say tonight. And uh, this is visit or school board number 12. Uh, in a row, I haven't missed one. and. Uh, I plan on being at all of them, so I guess I'll see you in two weeks. Our next speaker is Glenn Rydell. Good evening. My name is Glenn Rydell of 2945 Sewell Street, Lincoln, Nebraska. LPS District 2. Thanks for the opportunity to speak before you tonight. 90%, 90% of high school bowlers, high school club bowlers, 
Do not participate in another sport. You've heard this before, and I'm here to remind you of the importance of high school bullying. My daughter, a junior in high school, is one of those 90%. 42 schools. Beginning last November, 42 schools are currently involved in bowling competition under NSAA. From Class A all the way down to D6. It's time to fund high school bowling. About this time last year, it was decided that LPS would not fund high school bullying. The, this resulted in many students no longer participating in the sport of bullying. You all know the benefits of students in sports. Now is the time to start making decisions on the LPS athletic budget. Last summer, advocates for the LPS bullying spoke at these public meetings and met with an LPS board member and administrators. While no changes to the decision was made at the time, the meetings were positive and fruitful in conveying the importance of high school bullying. Those meetings were greatly appreciated. Since then, volunteers, many being league bowlers, organized an intra-city bowling club between students of LPS schools for our current winter season. The club consists of 17 students representing four LPS schools with 10 weekly practices and competition at three tournaments. This is a far cry from three years ago with 70 plus students representing all six schools. But it was good to see some students continue to evolve in the sport and receive the benefits similar to high school sports. Lincoln wants high school bowling. So we ask each of you to make inquiries into the athletic budget being created and ensure that high school bowling is part of that budget. Lincoln is the city of high school state bowling finals. We ask that Lincoln Public Schools become part of that. We ask for the students. Our next speaker is Liz Davids. Thank you so much. Good evening. It was so nice to hear from HYA. Um, they, they have a hard job ahead of them, and you have a hard job ahead of you. 573 open superintendent positions around the country. That is a lot. Um, so our, our best wishes are with you as you um, narrow this down and go through the process. Um, I would encourage, I guess I would encourage all the parents listening, all the students listening. Um, we have such a wonderful tool as technology and Google and uh, search engines. So I would encourage uh, the parents and the students to use those search engines and to research, research the candidates for themselves. Um, I've just been doing a, a cursory search myself and uh, I guess I would say that it's a blessing and a curse to be a public figure. Um, uh, Mr. Antoine Wilson has some articles out in the Washington Post um, about how he had to resign from Washington, D.C. schools. And of course, that always brings up a concern. I, w I hope that he will be given the chance to respond to that and to respond to that uh, publicity. Uh, a few years ago, um, in 2014, he, uh, there was a Lincoln Journal Star article about Mr. Wilson, about how he, uh, Lincolnite pursues social justice through education. Um, so that was seven years ago. So he was kind of a pioneer of social justice through education back then. And so um, not everyone loves those words, social justice through education. So that's another thing parents are going to want to search and students are going to want to search for themselves. and. Um, Dr. Tammy jo Jamie, excuse me, Jamie Jo Thompson um, looked like a couple years ago she was looking to move on to a different school, and I, I can't imagine being a public figure these days. Uh, every detail gets into the news, so um, there's a, a lot online. I would encourage parents and students to do their do their research um, in. This website, I think, is called TC Palm about Dr. Peter Licata from Florida. Um, 
he mentions the words. Um, he's interviewed and talks about being very close with uh, unions, which again is can be controversial. Um, he also talks about how he uh, uses the term about equity. It's not equality, it's equity. And so, again, would encourage the uh, community to do their research about these four candidates. Um, there was a post made today on Facebook, and um, it was a little controversial about this process. And so um, I did my research and went straight to the source who was at a meeting behind the scenes. And um, I'm sorry to hear that the person who made the post made it inflammatory on purpose so that people would rise up and be here angry at you. And I just want to set the record straight that talking to the source who was at the member of the meeting with members of the city council, the county board, the mayor, and former school board members, um, this person heard the mayor say that uh, we should look outside the Midwest and not be afraid to look at the coasts. And this person posted something more inflammatory on Facebook. So I wanted to set the record straight. That there's nothing wrong with looking outside the Midwest and not be afraid to look at the coasts. The thing that does concern me is that every person in this meeting was focused on LGBTQ issues and promoting that ideology. And there was no talk about academics. There was no talk about performance and scores. No, no improvement of educational outcomes. So I am concerned that there are forces behind the scenes that are promoting those issues that are really address just a few um, percentage points of all of our students instead of the academic and um, the outcomes that all of our students have to deal with. So I wish you the best in this process and I hope the community will do its due diligence and do research and attend all of the one minute please uh, all of the invitations that we have. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Amanda Ripley. Good evening, my name is Amanda Ripley. My address is on file. I've been reviewing the plans for the ESSER funds. I would like to suggest that some of the money be used to provide teachers with body cameras and microphones. I am aware that some teachers, maybe all, already have microphones that they wear when they are instructing. I see that one of the goals of the ESSER funds is to bridge the gap and get students caught up on the learning that has been lost over the last two years. Students being able to review their lessons when it works for them would go a long way in reinforcing the material for the students. We have heard since the beginning of this pandemic how exhausted the staff is. I don't doubt that. I don't see how adding additional after school support for students and summer school sessions to reinforce what has already been taught will help staff burnout and exhaustion. Body cameras would also provide the transparency that LPS has supposedly been wanting to provide. It would also provide a level of protection for your staff. There would be less opportunity for students to accuse staff of wrongdoing. Teachers would also be held accountable for the material that they're teaching. When talking to police officers who wear body cameras, they emphasize how grateful they are to have the technology available to record their actions and prove that they are acting appropriately. LPS continues to boast that it is proud of the education it's providing to students. Dr. Joel has denied that CRT is being taught in the schools. If you have nothing to hide, figuring out a way to put cameras in the classroom should not be that big of a deal in this day of modern technology. Parents can view their children in daycare and constantly watch their activities. LPS has a job to restore trust of the parents in this system. That would go a long way in bridging the gap. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gina Frank. Good evening, Gina. <laughs> Foot to sleep. Um, wow, that was that was a lot. Um, again, um, I'm just here to thank you guys for the work that you do and all of the effort that you put in. Um, thank you for looking at these uh, superintendent um, candidates. It's That's going to be a hard job to fill. Uh, I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> I, um, 
I have a teaching degree and I subbed for LPS for five years and I know that you guys do excellent work and I'm so glad that my child is in LPS um, and as a parent of a remote learning student I have got to I've gotten to see um, the classroom in action and I also would not want to be teaching right now so props to all the teachers that are out there putting in the work every day and it's not just eight hours it's like 14 hours um, if you're lucky and weekends so um, I just want to say thank you to all the teachers and uh, for the librarians for making sure that we have a diverse group of books I actually bought that book last week or the last time and it was interesting it's not the you know usual book that you would see uh, but it did talk about how the concept of whiteness not being German or having Scandinavian heritage, but whiteness, as in not a person of color, um, isn't something that kids chose. They didn't choose that. It's not their problem. They get to move forward in life. They get to move forward and they get to end this um, racism where people are judged you know, on their skin color. And um, I actually thought it was a really interesting book and it would spark some, some good conversations. Um, and I, I'm glad that it's staying in the, in the libraries. Um, I don't think that we should remove things just because somebody has a disagreement with it. I happen to be an atheist and I don't think we should remove every book that mentions religion. Um, that wouldn't be fair to the kids who are religious. That wouldn't be uh, fair to the kids who have questions about religion. Um, wouldn't be fair to my kid if my kid has a question about religion. Um, they should be able to look at all, um, opposing viewpoints and make decisions. So kids are good at critical thinking and I appreciate you guys for keeping the um, information there for kids to access. So thank you. I do not have any other blue cards. We will move on in our agenda. Our next item is the consent agenda. Is there a motion for approval of the consent agenda? Ms. Danik? I would move approval of consent items 8.1 through 8.4. Is there a second? Ms. Mumgard? I'll second that. Are there any questions, comments, or conflict statements? I have one. Out of an abundance of caution, I hereby declare a potential conflict of interest and hereby abstain from voting on check number 658842 to Nebraska Children and Families as part of agenda item 8.2A of the agenda materials for this meeting. I vote in favor of all other consent items. Are there any other conflict statements? Seeing none, Laura, would you please call the roll to approve the consent agenda? Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Okay. For first reading, item 9.2.1, the Nebraska Corn Board grant application, Dr. Larson. Thank you, Mrs. Duncan. This is a $20,000 grant proposal to the Nebraska Corn Board. The money does not require a match. It's for one year. It would be used to support teacher professional learning, uh, learning trips to East Campus, and curriculum development in support of the Early College uh, and Career STEM Academy focus program at Lincoln Northeast High School. Is there any discussion? <sighs> Ms. Danik, then Ms. Mumgard? Is there a date that this needs to be submitted by? No, okay. we can uh, have first reading tonight and at second reading approve it. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Ms. Mumgard? I think it sounds like a great idea. My question is, what does a one-year grant set us up to be able to do to follow? Allows through? us to get the program off the ground. When you start a new focus program, there's a great deal of initial professional learning that's required, a great deal of curriculum development that's required, visits to East Campus for both students and teachers. It really is a part of, no pun intended, the seed money that, that helps us develop and begin focus programs. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Any further discussion? Seeing none, this item will come back to us at our next meeting. 
Also for first reading, item 9.2.2, Nebraska Soybean Board at grant application. Yours again, Dr. Larson. Thank you. So again, uh, $20,000 to the Nebraska Soybean uh, Board. I, same purpose. I, I do want to thank both the Corn Board and the Soybean Board for their willingness to support this first ever partnership between uh, Kasner, the, the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources on East Campus, and one of our public schools in order to promote uh, this sort of focused study in the area of food and energy and water and societal systems. We're very fortunate to have that partnership and we'll thank these commodity boards that want to invest in that partnership. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Okay, this item will come back to us at our next meeting as well. Also for first reading, item 9.2.3, American Rescue Plan Homeless Children and Youth Grants through Nebraska Department of Education. Dr. Larson. Thank you. So what you have before you are actually two grants. So as a part of the U.S. Department of Education's funding under the American uh, Rescue Plan Act of 2021, there have been funds set aside to support students who are experiencing homelessness. The Nebraska Department of Education has a competitive grant and then a non-competitive grant. The non-competitive grant is available to those schools who already see, receive funding support students who are experiencing homelessness through the McKinney Vento funding. So one part of this would apply for our funds that would be allocated to us as a result of uh, that program. The competitive piece uh, we would apply for a grant that would ultimately support a full-time counselor at the high school level to support students who are experiencing homelessness. And we'd also then uh, support uh, Cedars Youth Services and having an outreach person on the street to support students and connect them to resources if they're experiencing homelessness. The non-competitive piece, we would add to our student advocates in the homeless area. I would ask that you would move this to action tonight because of the deadline. Is there a motion for approval? Ms. Danick. I would move that we set aside our policy and in one reading for two readings tonight and approve the motion that the board approve the submission of two proposals for the American Rescue Plan Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Homeless Children and Youth Grants one for approximately $240,000 for competitive funds and the other for $220,506 for non-competitive funds. And is there a second? Mr. Boswell? Second. Is there any discussion? Go ahead, Ms. Baumgart. Have we seen an increase, because we've had the McKinney-Vento grant for a while and and we've used it well. Have we seen an increase in our homeless population? Uh, Dr. Hicks, do you have current numbers? Can you come to the podium and or, answer I the mean question? Ballpark, you? like, would work too, since that's kind of out of the blue question. Hello. Um, we have, uh, I don't have the exact number. We're in the 350 range, but our um, homeless uh, coordinator does feel like there's more students than in the past that we have not identified and we're seeing that nationally as well. And so we really feel like these, these funds would help us to um, identify some of the students that are missing and provide more wraparound services. And is, is, the, is some of the issue, has it been, would this also be, I know our advocates are very helpful in recognizing students who are also on the edge of, you know, and so forth, is that the idea with the advocates aspect is that Recognizing the students and, pa and families who are on the edge of trouble. Is it waiting until they're homeless? Is that kind of all the wraparound as you're talking about? No, um, preventive services uh, are also included and very important. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion, Ms. Danny? One of the things I greatly appreciate about the, the individuals in our departments that provide assistance for our homeless children is that they also help protect the children from the stigma, stigma of being homeless, from someone who's worked with kids who have been homeless in the past, and they don't want anybody to know that they're homeless. They go to great lengths to make sure those kids feel totally included within their buildings and that the services are there. So I just want to say thank you for all you do for that. And I'm glad that if we get this grant approved, it's just one more bit of help to make sure that these kids are protected and served. Thank you. Any further discussion?
Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 9.2.3. Mr. Boswell. Yes. Mrs. Danik. Yes. Mr. Mayhew. Yes. Ms. Melgard. Yes. Dr. Rauner. Yes. Mrs. Duncan. Yes. Also on first reading, item 9.2.4, the Leffler Middle School Addition and Renovation Project, number 10455. Mr. Wieskamp. Uh, good evening, and if you would allow me, I might veer from the agenda slightly, if that would be okay. It's um, all yours. Earlier in consent agenda, just so you know, you approved a number of contracts for furnishings, fixtures, and equipment for two buildings that will open in barely over six months in Robinson Elementary and Lincoln Northwest, just so you know. Uh, we are actively uh, acquiring, uh, purchasing all of those products. Matt Bellamy and the, and the purchasing department are very active in that. The second part of that consent agenda was some easements for Lincoln Electric System and Lancaster Rural Water District and some right-of-way acquisition by the city for improvements regarding the annexation and development agreement that we have, LPS, with the city of Lincoln. So. You approved a number of those things and contracts and agreements for us to continue to move forward and open those buildings on time and on schedule. So um, I'll come back to Leffler. And actually the next three, even though you'll handle them one at a time, are three bids that we received in the last couple of weeks. Two weeks ago I was up here and we talked about the Dawes bid, which was roughly 30% over budget and that caused concern because we talked about what does that mean for the remainder of the 2020 bond program moving forward? And we have about 40 to $45 million worth of projects yet to bid. And if we were 30% over budget, that's another $15 million. And so we were nervous about that. It is a risk. These three projects, I will say, uh, frankly, they are over budget, but the over budget is like single digit percentage. So nothing close to what we were at Dawes. Uh, we have collective contingency built in that I think we would recommend as staff that we continue to move forward with these projects. They are exactly what we wanted in terms of the design and the scope of the project. So we talked about this at planning today. Uh, I'm sure if there are other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But the Leffler project, we had four bidders. Kingery Construction was the apparent low uh, for about 2.874 million. And if we could waive two readings, uh, I would request that, uh, that we could do it in one reading and move forward. Very good. Mr. Boswell. Yes, um, before I make the motion, a quick ask. Uh, are you gonna ask us to waive second reading on the other two items as well? I will. Okay, if it's all right then, I will move that we waive second reading and approve items 9.2.4, 9.2.5, and 9.2.6. And is there a second? Mr. Bob, uh, Mr. Mayhew. I second. Any discussion? Okay. I would like Scott to go through the other two uh, bonds that we're doing just so that we have all of that Perfect. information out in the public. What was that again? I'm sorry. I want you to go through all three of the projects, talk about what you're going to do at Leffler, talk about what you're going to do at the Fuse, so that the public knows what's going to happen. I can do that. At Leffler, at Leffler Middle School, we are doing a expansion to the cafeteria, multi-purpose room. We're also doing enhancements to all of the specialized programs from art, family, consumer science, uh, career tech ed, so all of those spaces within the building get uh, touched. We're also doing some parking lot and traffic flow upgrades uh, within the site. So it's a very congested area if you've been over there on 48th Street. So those improvements are also part of the project. The 9.2.5, the FUSE, Food, Energy, Water, and Societal Systems, is a focus program investment at Lincoln Northeast and we're basically doing an entire renovation of the library to accommodate that program. So the library will still exist in its entirety in that location, but it will coexist with the focus program. So it's very innovative space. Um, we've met with staff since last summer, quite frankly, to get to this point. It's a great project. One of many focus programs that we're investing in, as you mentioned earlier, the Bryan uh, pr uh, project out at Lincoln Northwest. Uh, we're investing in the aviation program at Lincoln North Star. Uh, we're investing in the FUSE program at Lincoln Northeast. We will spend money on arts and humanities, and there will be potentially be a focus program at, at Standing Bear. So we have money available in the bond program for that. And the last one on here is Rousseau Elementary School, and we took on the hardest project of all regarding traffic flow and parking. 
And I will guarantee you right now that it's not a perfect solution, but it's a much improved solution. We work with the city traffic and a consultant on this project, and so that's what that entails. Any further discussion? Mr. Boswell. Yes, um, so Scott, again, thank you to you and your team for your work in managing all of these projects. Uh, tier one of the 2020 bond program includes buildings like the two new high schools, Rousseau Elementary, a number of additions across the entire district, upgrades. Um, we've talked two weeks ago and again tonight about four projects that are coming up that are over the initial estimates that we put together. But when you step back and you look at the entire scope of tier one in the projects, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked you in planning earlier today. Do you feel like we have the ability and the resources to accomplish the tier one projects that we committed to the community? I'll give you an easy answer or a short answer is yes. Right now I feel very confident about that. I'll add to that, I mentioned that we bid the Everett indoor air quality project, Everett uh, Elementary School this Thursday, and that's about a 10 or $11 million project uh, out of that 40 some million dollars left, and so we're gonna have a good idea of where we're headed uh, with that climate. We had 45 people show up for a pre-bid, so we know that there's, there's interest in that project. Great. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 9.2.4, 9.2.5, and 9.2.6. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Ms. Melgard? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mrs. Danek? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Also on first reading, item 9.2.7, the class annual Chromebook purchases, grade six and nine. Kirk, it is all yours. Thank you, Mrs. Duncan. Um, this is the uh, annual purchase of uh, sixth and ninth grade Chromebooks that we do each and every year. What's a little bit different uh, about this year's uh, purchase is uh, really probably three different things. First, um, this is happening at a time where uh, uh, supply chains are constrained and um, it's happening at a time when there is a, an abundance of ESSER's money and emergency connectivity fund money that is allowing uh, people to put in orders at a pretty good rate. Um, so uh, we are going to be in competition for a new model that has just been released last week. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit different than what it's been for the past couple of years. Um, another difference uh, here is that also we have applied for and been granted emergency connectivity funds to go against this purchase. Um, so that is why, in a sense, this, this is a bit split. Uh, earlier in the consent agenda, uh, you approved uh, the purchase of the Google licensing um, that will go in, that goes in conjunction with this purchase. Um, but because it's emergency connectivity funding that does not cover that licensing, that needed to be covered separately. Um, so that's a little bit of a difference as well. And then finally, uh, ordinarily, we like to make it the case that when we're, uh, when something's two readings, that there's an opportunity uh, to, to make sure that you can run that full process. In this case, I would ask um, that, uh, that you uh, go ahead and set aside uh, that requirement and allow this to uh, be done in a single reading so that we may uh, make the order and get, a, get in queue. Very good. Is there a motion for approval, Mr. Boswell? Yeah, I move that we waive second reading and approve item 9.2.7, class annual Chromebook purchases for grades six and nine. And is there a second, Ms. Danning? Yes, I would approve that, or yes. I would second that motion to approve that. Perfect, is there any discussion? Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 9.2.7. Ms. Mungard? Yes. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. For second reading and recommended for action this evening, 10.1.1 East Lincoln High and North Star School Choice filing deadline of January 31st. Is there a motion for approval? Mr. Boswell? Move approval of item 10.1.1. Is there a second? Ms. Danik? I would second that motion and then I have a comment. Is there any discussion? I there's Ms. Danik and then Mr. Boswell. There's been a little concern that with the new high schools opening, so I want Dr. Larson just to reiterate what happens if a school population that we've closed uh, to transfer, how they can handle that uh, so that they don't lose as many students. 
the student population drops below a certain amount. If a significant number of students were to move from one building to another and the building they left from had been closed, we could reopen it. We uh, open and close classrooms or buildings continuously throughout the school year based on current student population. So this is not necessarily a permanent closure of a building. That could change based on student population. And what we would look at is where are we with respect to student enrollment and that particular building's capacity. Because obviously one of the reasons to open new high schools is to you know, address the overcapacity issue that we currently have at our six comprehensive high schools. Thank you. I'm sure that will meet the uh, questions my constituents have. <coughs> Mr. Boswell. Yes, thank you. Um, so this item was discussed at our last meeting, but I know one of the reasons that we have it on our agenda tonight is so that we have the opportunity to uh, make sure people are aware of the January 31st filing deadline. And with that in mind, I'd just like to invite Dr. Larson to make uh, any remarks that he'd like to make on this item so that we can get the word out. Thank you, Mr. Boswell. That, that's a very important reminder that next Monday, January the 31st, is the deadline for incoming ninth graders, so our current eighth graders, to complete the high school selection form and choose the high school they wish to attend next year. I would also remind students that current ninth, 10th, and 11th grade students uh, have been assigned their current high school for next year. So should they wish to move to a high school that's open, they should make that transfer request now as well. That will help us even out the building enrollments and, and address the staffing issues that we need to address. Very good. Any further discussion? Ms. Munker. How do you do the transfer request? Where do you go and where do you look? Contact student services and they will help students and parents through the process or a student could go to their counselor at their high school and also initiate the process that way. At their high school or at their middle school? At their current high school, yes. But Sorry, I might not, I could If you're not. going into middle, if you're in middle school going in, you would also can do it from... Yes, you could also contact your uh, middle school counselor. Okay, great, thanks. Any further discussion? Just one. Ms. Danny. So when, if someone misses a deadline, and I know the answer to this, but I'm asking it anyway, uh, parents still have the option that they can appeal a rejection that they can't move to a, a closed building. That's absolutely right. There is a subcommittee of your board that looks at appeals that parents make if their request to transfer is initially denied. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 10.1.1. Mr. Boswell. Yes. Mrs. Danik. Yes. Mr. Mayhew. Yes. Ms. Mumgard. Yes. Dr. Browner. Yes. Mrs. Duncan. Yes. 10.2.1, State 21st Century Community Learning Center's grant continuation applications. Is there a motion for approval? Mr. Mayhew. I move approval. Is there a second? Mr. Boswell? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 10.2.1. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. 10.2.2, the Community Learning Center Agreements with Family Service, Malone and Lincoln Parks and Rec, number 10468. Is there a motion for approval? Ms. Mumgard? I'll move that. Is there a second? Mr. Boswell? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 10.2.2. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danny? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. 10.2.3, the resolution for option enrollment students 2022 to 2023. Is there a motion for approval? Ms. Danik? I would move approval. Is there a second? Ms. Mumgard? I'll second it. Any discussion? Ms. Danik? I would just like to highlight that the date for option enrollment that they have to be received is August 5th of 2022. We set a date every year. It's usually about a week before we start school. Um, <laughs> option enrollment, just for those who aren't sure, is people who do not currently live within the confines of Lincoln Public Schools boundaries. 
So if someone wanted to go from a neighboring community to Lincoln Public Schools, they have to option in by August 5th. Any further discussion? If this is approved, sorry. There you go. <laughs> Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 10.2.3. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Browner? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danning? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Item 10.2.4, the Dawes Middle School Addition and Renovation Project, number 10412. Is there a motion for approval? Mr. Boswell? Move approval of item 10.2.4. Is there a second? Ms. Danik? I would second that. Is there any discussion? Ms. Danik? So, Scott, you and I had some conversations about why we thought this, this bid was over. Does any of this have to do with a really compact site that we're trying to make an addition on? Uh, that's one piece of it. It's a very complicated project because it touches the building in so many areas. I mean, we're expanding the cafeteria. We have to put a corridor on the south side so we can get past the two existing gyms to get to the third gym, which is a new addition. And so, like I said, it just touches the building in so many places. So it's, it's messy in that regard. Architecturally, I think it's a great solution to the project. Uh, and consistent with your earlier question, we're doing program enhancements throughout the building and some parking and traffic improvements as well. So it, it's a good project and it's why we had it on the bond program from day one. It, there were program deficiencies at that facility. And they're bringing up the science, the science programs, the family consumer science programs. It's going to increase the physical education program and health programming to make it match what's at the other schools, correct? Y yes. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll to approve item 10.2.4. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I do not have any emergency actions, nothing removed from consent agenda. That brings us to informational items and reports. Are there any board committees wishing to report tonight? From the Career Academy, Mr. Boswell? No report. Which brings us to the superintendent's update, Dr. Joel. Just a very, very quick one. Uh, this is the time of year we celebrate board service. It's National School Board Week. And um, just want to say on behalf of 40,000 students and 8,000 staff and a very, very grateful executive team and administrative team as well as community, thank you for your board service. You know, reading the, uh, the articles that have appeared in the national media, this has been a very, very challenging year across America with so many complex issues that educators and school board members have to, have to address. At the end of the day, we have to put our students foremost in our minds, and, and sometimes those decisions are difficult decisions and not always in complete agreement with others. But I just want um, our community to know that we are so appreciative of your commitment and your dedication, the time that you put in just on a superintendent search, um, and it's not over. The, uh, the committee work that, that you do, each of you serve on multiple committees. The volunteer work you do at your building sites and in the areas that you represent, your meeting with teacher contact teams, I can go on and on and on. The community gets an incredible value out of your board service and um, again, representing the entire district. We just want to say thank you very much. Can we give the board a, a, a hand? That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Joel. We needed to leave, leave on a happy note like that. <laughs> uh, we do have a, a monthly financial report. Are there any questions? All right, that brings us to the announcements of upcoming events for the board. January 30th, we have the NASB Legislative Issues Conference at six o'clock at the Cornhusker Hotel. January 31, the NASB Legislative Issues Conference again, 8 a.m., all day there at Cornhusker Hotel. February 1, Superintendent Finalist Interviews here at LPSDO. February 2, the Chamber Coffee at 8 o'clock a.m. at the Chamber Office. And February 4, the Superintendent Finalist Interviews also here at LPSDO. 
And that brings us to our next item of public comment. I do not have any blue cards. I do have a request from staff for closed session for items number one, negotiations, number six, personnel, and number seven, legal advice. Is there a motion? Mr. Mayhew? I move to go into closed session for reasons numbers one, six, and seven. And is there a second? Ms. Baumgard? Yes, let's. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Laura, would you please call the roll on the motion to go into closed session for items number one, negotiations, number six, personnel, and number seven, legal advice. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Browner? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danning? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. This meeting is in recess for the closed session.